I want to thank our brother George for his kind words of welcome. When he said, I'm away here, brother, I thought he's away home. <laughs> he just shook hands and said, it's all yours now. It's a wee bit daunting to be left up here, but Joanna's with me and she'll kick me in the shins or the heels when, whenever it's her turn to get up. We're going to play a game called Toast. I feel like I'm doing a children's social. That means I'm going to sit down, Joanna's going to pop up, and she's going to sit down, and I'm going to pop up, so it's going to be like toast, um, one or the other. So uh, we're glad to be here tonight to testify. It's lovely to uh, give account of our salvation, of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saving us and using us. And I was talking to brother tonight about gifts, about neglecting not the gift that is within you. And I can honestly f say that we are living in the center of God's will, and we love it. We love what we do, and we do what we love uh, every day of the year, every week, every month. Uh, we just feel life is worth living, and we've found the purpose God has for us on this earth. And uh, people say, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. That's true, but I don't want to go to heaven just yet. I'm enjoying life. I'm enjoying earth. I'm enjoying serving. Because once you get to heaven, you can't keep telling people about the Lord. Because if somebody up there, everyone should know the Lord, will know the Lord. Because if you don't know the Lord, you'll not be in heaven. And that's why it's a matter of urgency to preach the gospel to everyone. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be or shall be saved. I'm going to read a couple of verses. Uh, if you turn in your book to Ecclesiastes, it's a lovely romantic story. I can see Alan and Jillian in the front row really just listening uh, um, to this lovely story. It is a good story. God has been good, but the Bible is a wonderful book. And the book of Ecclesiastes tells us it's really challenging. Just two verses, chapter 9 and the verse uh, 9 and 10. Just as I look over the congregation, you can see many faces we saw there a few, just seemed like a few months ago. Brother George was saying four and a half years ago. Uh, I haven't changed any, but George seems to change a whole lot. He doesn't have a water pistol on him. Um, that's what people say to me, where's your water pistol? I goes, I don't shoot on Sunday. <laughs> um, that mission was a wonderful mission. It was timely and it certainly encouraged us on our walk with God and our work for God. And uh, we still, we've got messages from grandparents connected with children who were converted to that mission. And uh, at that time, and even a few years after that, just reminding us about their child who's still going on with God, now at high school, and it's really encouraging to hear little reports like that. I'll not say the name in case their grandmother's here, and uh, in case it said something out of turn. But Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9 and 10, it says, Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And as I look back upon my own life, just married, realize God's been good. He's given me a wife, given me a job, given me a home. But then the Lord says, what about me? What about me? I'll give you everything. You've got your health. You've got your wife. You've got your job. You've got your home. Everything this earth could give. But the Lord says, what about me? Are you willing to give it all up? Forsake that and follow me. And that's been our prayer. And 20 years ago, this last month, we entered Bible college just to start serving the Lord. And we've never looked back. We've always went forward. I'm going to give my testimony in a few minutes, and then Joanna's going to come up and give hers. Then we're going to connect. Then we're going to keep going forward like Moses. Some people get married. They think they've had a brick wall. Whenever you get married, you go forward, and you go with the, where, the, where the Lord has you to go. But uh, at the age of 17, I was learning to drive a car. I grew up in a, didn't really need to learn. I grew up in a farm of seven boys, no girls. When a, girl's, when a girl come onto our street on the farm, everyone was interviewing her. We didn't really see many. We lived out in the countryside, so uh, we were boys. We didn't do dishes. We ate food. We dirty dishes. We dirty clothes, but we didn't wash clothes. We didn't help mum. Mum was a lone ranger, and she's still alive to this day, 82 years old, and she's like 32. And you, if you go out a step, she'll still crack you with a, with a spoon. And I, I was in the, the house the other day, and I pulled out the wee drawer, and the wee wooden spoons are all there. And some of them are cracked, and they're glued. 
and I, I closed the cupboard really quickly in case you pull one out on me. But still, that's the way we were brought up. We had a great childhood. It was simple. Um, we didn't have fancy things in this world, but we loved. We made the best of everything we had. We played together. And uh, remember as a child, every night before we went to bed, mum would set us all down and read the big family Bible, that big yellow children's book. And then we would take in turns, we would read it each night. And, uh, but all through my childhood, through my teenage years, I wasn't a Christian. And I could have told the books of the Bible, every story, but for some reason I was not saved. I went through high school, people thought I was a Christian, there was no Christians in my class, I was the one. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I was good living, but I wasn't saved. And at the age of 17, mum says to me one Sunday afternoon, I'm going to go to a mission, will you, will you take me? And to be honest, I, I did not want to go, I thought when I'm 18, I'm away. I'm going to explore the world, be like the prodigal, whatever it is, I want to go out there and adventure. But God has all these things, and it's wonderful. And of course, I thought, Mom doesn't drive, she's got a license, but I have a license and I couldn't drive on my own, so I said, yep, I'll drive all the way from Dundraw to Lisburn, seven miles. And I thought, wow, that's like a summer holiday. And I drove the whole way, sat in the front row. The old evangelist, don't know if any of you remember him, Noel Grant, uh, old evangel, and he's preaching. He's like George. He doesn't stand still when he's preaching, and he doesn't miss it. And I sat there, and it's one of those meetings, I thought, am I the only person here? When I reach 18, I'm going to join the police. I'm going to do something with my life. I'm going to make it worthwhile living. And of course, he says, what about your soul? And the challenge comes in. You've been brought up in the gospel. You know the Bible. But when the Lord comes back, it's down to the side because he doesn't know you. It was one of those meetings. I was under conviction for a long time in my own church. I knew this was my time. and I was so conscious of my spirit shall not always strive with man. And I thought every day I hear the gospel could be my last time. And I knew God wanted to save me. I knew he had a purpose and a plan. But the Lord was not going to execute that until I surrendered my life and my sin. And that night I sent, and I trembled, and I could not go out the door until I spoke to that man. And he brought me into a wee room in the kitchen, and he didn't have to explain the gospel to me. I just totally surrendered. I said, I know what to do. And I need to do this now. And I wept like a child. Never be afraid of tears. I wept like a child. Thinking, how, how, could, how could God love me that much? Totally useless, worthless. There's so many people, nice people, good people. And I'm just a farmer's son. Nothing the world would want if the Lord loved me that much. And I cried and I begged the Lord and told him I was sorry and just wanted to come in and cleanse my heart. And he done that. And I come back out and everyone else had gone. That's the night I got saved. Whosoever shall call, whosoever met me. And I just asked the Lord to come into my heart and into my life. No fancy prayer. I didn't know any fancy words or big words. I just said, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need you and I want you. Will you please come in? The Lord didn't start reading out the rad act. You're a bad boy. You're this, you're that. You didn't make through to P7. P6, didn't even go to P7. No GCSEs to my name, no exams, nothing. But the Lord says, I'll take your life. I'll make something of it. And I remember going out, big, strong, 17-year-old boy. Everyone had gone home, and there's my mum sitting in the front. Wee woman, as face as red as a beet with the tears dripping her face. I realized every day since I was born, one person loved me, and that was my mom. All her boys the same. And that was the night God answered her prayer, because God, she saw how I responded. And I'd come out and I said, Mom, I'm sorry for the way I've been living, a rebellious child, not nice, cheeky, and all those things that goes with young people. She didn't want to know. She was just glad I was saved. Then we drove home, and uh, life changed then. Old things passed away. You wanted to serve the Lord in your local church and the YMCA and all these things. I was now 21 years old. I loved traveling. Didn't really travel far apart from Lisbon and Belfast the odd time. I was involved in the YMCA and I went to America to do summer camp. Got a bug for traveling. And I was working at Marks and Spencer now for about four years. I worked there for six years in Sprucefield. I used to love working in that place. I used to wear a shirt and tie. And um, 
people will walk past and I would put stuff in their trolleys while they weren't looking and it's the sort of thing I do to maximize profit, minimize loss. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd watch their face going through the go through the tills. That's not mine, that couldn't be mine. And you'd put all these big French baguettes in their trolleys and they're so f- sorry, maybe you were one of those people, but I helped fill your trolley to make sure I kept my job. Um, not going to talk about those things, but I was now 21 years old, and uh, a girl thing was, a girl was the last person in my mind. I thought, that's no problem, I'm a boy, I'll just click my fingers and I'll have an interview panel here and any wife, uh, but that's, that's only your dream, and then you wake up and realize that's not true. Um, I wanted to go to Europe with two friends, we went all around Europe. My cousin said to me, let's go to German, or Poland, because the Iron Curtain has come down in 1989. And I said, why do you want to go there? And he goes, why not? And I said, the, the Pope lives in Poland. Don't really need to see the Pope. I don't, I'd rather go to France or Spain. He said, let's go and explore it. We left on Sunday, arrived in Poland on Friday. We arrived in Warsaw. The capital was just a big concrete block. It was destroyed by the war. And these Americans, we were just going to leave and go to Austria. And these Americans said, why didn't you stop at Krakow? I goes, what's that? Because it's another, another city. Never been destroyed by the war, it's a lovely place. So we put our bags in a youth hostel and went into the city. Thousands of young people all over this big square and uh, went into a little cafe and suddenly one of the big windows, like these windows, big tall windows was opened and I noticed this girl standing with the white clothes, the red bandana and I thought, who is that there? It wasn't normally like that there when I saw a girl but it was like at that time, I was male and I saw a female. And I thought a lot of relationship was the last thing in my mind. I was enjoying working, enjoying farming, enjoying life. But I went, if George ever told you how I met Tracy, it was a similar, a similar thing happened. I went for her. And I said, excuse me, do you speak English? She goes, yes, I do. She goes, what's wrong? And I goes, um, I'm trying to understand the menu. It's in Polish. She said, no, it's in English and Polish. <laughs> and I go, oh, oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> She was, um, so this was Joanna, and we met that night. We spent a couple of hours chatting. The next day, she came in her little metro car. There's three of us, and she said, if we were going to go to Auschwitz, the concentration camp, and she says, if you pay the petrol, I'll take you to the camp and bring you back again. We filled it up for eight pounds. So I said to my friends, right, that's four pounds each, and that's it all covered. And my two friends, and she took us and brought us back again. But then the chemistry started. Joanna started to fall for me. It's a lovely thing when a girl falls for you. Alan told me all about that too, Jillian. So that's the way it works. And it was powerful. And I said, what's happening to me? And then the next day we had to leave and she gave me a photograph and I put her address and now I'm leaving. And I said, my heart, there's something wrong with it. I said, I can't stop thinking about this girl. I was falling in love. That's a lovely thing, to fall in love. I remember it so clearly. And my friends said, look at those mountains. And I'm like, look at that picture. It's unbelievable. But then 10 weeks we traveled. No phone numbers, no conversations, no texts. Didn't even have a phone. Then, and I got back home and I was troubled. I said, Lord, I'm a Christian. You have saved me for a purpose. This girl, I know nothing about her. She's good crack. She's, she's a girl, she's female, thank the Lord. And that's all I knew about her. She was just a person who lived in Poland. And I began to write her a letter. It was nice to meet you, but I'm a Christian. Trying to take my stand for the Lord, that's important. And I thought, this girl's going to be a Catholic, she's going to be a nun. And whenever I did meet her, Joanna said she was going to be studying at university, and she said, if I don't pass my exams, I'm going to become a nun. I said, praise it, none of this, none of that. That's what I was telling her, so she passed her exams. But Joanna told me this here. Um, I wrote her a letter saying, I'm a Christian. Just what I told you a few minutes ago, at the age of 17, I surrendered my life to the Lord, and He saved me. Two months later, I got, a phone call, I got a letter back, and it says, Dear Colin, it's nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you. And it's nice to know that Jesus means so much to you. And she went on to say hi on Easter Saturday. Five months before that, I, I got saved. I became a Christian. And she said, ever, ever since that time, I've been praying that God will send into my life a man. And I shared it. Praise the Lord! I'm your man. <laughs> and that's how it all started. It was powerful. But Joanna's going to tell you how that all came about. No, just don't understand. Certainly, I was so glad that I was able to write back to Colin uh, that I do have testimony and that I am born again Christian. Um, it, it was just, uh, I had a wonderful feeling that I was able to just 
put, it, uh, put a pen on the paper and write it all down. But how did it all start? Well, I grew up in Poland, and I can tell you, uh, when, when I was growing up in Poland, and even now, um, majority of people in Poland, and I'm talking about maybe 99% of people, probably have never met a Christian person in their lives, have never met a born-again believer. Um, so this is the type of country I grew up in. Uh, I grew up in. Um, I grew up in a Catholic family, and pretty much everybody, when I was growing up in, in Poland, everybody were of a Roman Catholic faith. And of course, you know, that meant that we were baptized as a little infants. Uh, at the age of seven or eight, you had to go um, and confess your sins for the first time to the priest. Um, and, you know, we just went to the Mass every Sunday, and we would just went through all those things. But since I was a little girl, I was quite often thinking, you know, about God. I was wondering, first of all, is he really there? Is it a real thing? Quite often I thought maybe this whole religion is just a made up thing. Maybe God is just a wee story just to make us people better people. Um, then I was wondering, what is God like? Where is he? How can I get closer to him? And you know, I was trying all different things. Uh, I remember together, together with my best friend, Eve, we went to the priest and we said, what can we do, uh, how can we help? So he used to give us different tasks to do, like maybe visit elderly people. Um, he would send us to different camps. Uh, we even went on a foot pilgrimage when we walked every day for 20 miles, praying and saying our rosaries and all those things. And you know what? None of those things really brought us any closer to God. Um, and we tried all kinds of things. I remember even, um, I was in the, in the college, um, and my best friend, my friend in the college, she invited me to come to those masses for students. They were at seven o'clock in the morning from Monday to Friday. And during the, those masses, uh, we sang a chorus. And you know, that chorus, that little tiny chorus really made me think. And you probably know this chorus. Uh, it's a very, a very well known chorus uh, over here. And it just says, Jesus, name above all names. Beautiful Savior, glorious Father, Emmanuel, God is with us. Beautiful Savior and living word. Especially the first line, Jesus name above all names. I was just thinking, what does it mean that Jesus can be name above all names? I just couldn't grasp it. But at the same time, it was just, I could feel there's something about it. And I just remember one time we sang this chorus again and I just closed my eyes and I said in my heart, God, please show me if you're really there somewhere, if you're re real God, if you exist, please show me what do these words mean? What does it mean that Jesus is named above all names? And you know, God, I know now looking back, God heard that prayer. And I really want to encourage you to just to pray for things, pray for your friends, Pray for things, pray for your family, because um, God really answers our prayers. I know that that prayer wasn't really very complicated, it wasn't long, there was no fancy words and it. it was just a simple prayer from the heart, and I know that God heard that little prayer. And it didn't happen overnight, sometimes we uh, want our answers straight away, we want the prayers to be uh, answered very, very quickly, but it took a little while. and. Um, Basically, uh, after a while, I, I just stopped. Uh, uh, I started to miss Sunday masses, and I stopped going to the church eventually. But in the meantime, I started all the other things like um, uh, horoscopes, future telling. Uh, I was very interested in stars and all those things. Uh, I became vegetarian. Um, I started to go to a county that was uh, a vegetarian county that was run by Buddhist people, and I nearly became Buddhist. Uh, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. All those things uh, that I was trying were fascinating for a while, but none of those things really brought what I was, uh, you know, brought to me what I was looking for. And I went to university, and there I had few friends. We knew each other very well for years and years and years. And um, I noticed that suddenly something changed in few of them. Uh, first of all, they started to talk about God a lot, which is very, very unusual in Poland. Uh, in Poland, you just don't talk about God. You, you sort of keep it, you know, inside of you. Um, I also noticed that those few friends would meet from time to time in the little room uh, of the university, 
And one of them would bring the guitar, they would sing some songs, and every time they came out, there was just that sense of peace about them. And I couldn't understand what's going on, what are they doing, you know, why are they meeting, what is it that changed in them, why are they talking about God? And eventually, um, I was on the bus home, uh, there was a boy called Martin from that group, we were living very close to each other, and we were sitting in the bus and I said to him, Martin, what is going on? There's something that changed in you recently. And I noticed that you also meet together. What, what is it that you're doing together? And he just put a hand in his pocket and he took a little book that looked like this one, maybe it was a little bit smaller, and he opened it and he told me that, first of all, he told me that he became a Christian, which I thought that was very strange because uh, I never heard anything like this, that you have to become a Christian. Um, and then he also opened that book and I've never seen a Bible before. Um, you see, we were never ever encouraged to have Bibles. The only time we ever heard from the Bible was when the priest read it uh, on the Sunday Mass, and he, he usually would read uh, maybe just small portions of the Psalms or New Testament. And when, I, when Martin opened that Bible, I just couldn't believe it. Every single verse was underlined, highlighted with different colors and markers. And I thought, wow, that must be such an important book. And straight away, that just drew me like a magnet. I really wanted to know what makes this book so important. And I asked him, I said, Martin, can you come to my house from time to time and can you show me uh, a little bit from the Bible? So um, he would come to my house and we would open up the Bible. Um, we would read maybe half a chapter or the whole chapter and then we would talk about it. And these were the times when for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. I never heard it anywhere else. And at the start, of course, you know, my heart was very close. I was like, mm, I don't know if that's for me. Uh, I thought, uh, this, this just sounds far too simple. I always thought life has to be more complicated than that. But Jesus doesn't make things very complicated. He actually makes things more simple for us and more clear uh, in our lives. Um, so at the start, I thought, no, this is far too simple. But what I didn't know was that uh, Martin and, and those few friends they started to pray for me. And now again, looking back, I know that God answered their prayers. And again, I really want to encourage you to continue to pray for your friends. If, if somebody comes to your mind, like a friend or family member or somebody, just pray for them. I think sometimes we make that mistake that we don't pray because we're afraid that God will not answer our prayers. We're just too scared. But we should really pray because God answered my friend's prayer, prayers. Uh, because eventually there came one day, and it was Easter Saturday of the year 1993. That was the same year when Colin was traveling uh, around Europe. Um, and I was just, uh, I remember one morning, it was Easter Saturday, and I opened my eyes uh, after waking up in the morning, and I just knew in my heart that I want to have Jesus in my life. I knew that everything I heard uh, from the Bible, from Martin, I just knew it was true. Um, I knew that I don't understand a lot of things still. I still need to learn so much, but I knew that I didn't want to put it off any longer. I want to invite Lord Jesus into my life. And I found Martin, he came to my house straight away, and we just knelt down uh, on the wooden floor of my kitchen, and he prayed first, then I prayed. And I just simply asked, I didn't even know how to pray, but I just simply asked uh, Lord Jesus to take away my sins, to forgive me all my stubbornness, my disbelief, and just come into my life and come into my heart. And you know, that was really the best moment of my life. That was, um, it was like um, just complete U-turn. Um, and I knew that Jesus brought a real peace um, and he's, uh, into my life. And I knew, I knew that he will always be with me every you know, step of the way. And I can read a, a Bible verse that really would sum up what God has done for me. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. You know, God really helped me. He really made total difference in my life. Um, and um, after that, I started to go uh, to a little Baptist church uh, in Krakow, in Poland, where I was living. And um, very quickly, I started to pray about different things. And one of the things I started to, started to pray for was, um, well, I was 24 years uh, of age at that time, and I didn't have a boyfriend. And I, I thought, well, I started to go to this little Baptist church. There's only a handful of people there. 
how will I ever meet a godly husband? But I just decided to pray about it. Um, I didn't really think much about it, but I just prayed uh, every now and then. And um, eventually, uh, on the 10th of September, the same year, just a few months later, I was out with my friends, and that was the night when we met with Colin. And then um, um, Colin will tell you uh, whatever else. <laughs> and then she's been in love ever since. That's the end of that part of the story. <laughs> So we met, and then, of course, we wondered, um, God has us to be together, so you make a proposal. And uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, I went into one of the, the sitting room, we called it. That's a, the good room. Uh, whenever you have visitors, <laughs> mom takes them into the good room. Heavy curtains, they were all closed, and I snuck the phone into it, and I phoned Joanna up, and I said, if I was to ask you to marry me, what would you say? Then I heard this coughing. And I put the light on, my twin, my twin brother, he's lying sleeping in the settee, and he wakes up. So I just hung up on her. He says to me, he's notorious for uh, talking in his sleep. And he says to me that night, I took off like a rocket. He says, did, did you ask, did I dream, or was this real? Did you ask Joanna to marry you? I goes, what are you talking about, you're dreaming again? He goes, I'm really sure it was so real in my dream that I was certain that you, I heard you asking Joanna to marry you. And it was true, but I didn't tell him. So I wrote her a letter, and I said, um, would, you, would you like to get married? And she did. She came over with a, a wedding dress in one hand and a suitcase in the other, and that was her emigrating from Poland to, to um, Northern Ireland. And we got married here, all of my family, none of her family, and of course I wanted to ask her, Dad, can I have the hand of your daughter in marriage, please? Of course, he doesn't speak Polish or English, and I don't speak Polish. So to say please, I said, proche. You're supposed to say prosha, but I said prosha, which means pig. And I used to say, daughter, you say turka. So I said, pig, can I hand, have the hand of your turkey and marries? And he just looked up myself as two heads, and he actually started to speak in French. Absolimo, absolimo. And Joanna's brother spent about two hours teaching me one sentence, and I still got it all wrong. Somebody said to me tonight, the brother at the door, do you speak Polish? I said, din dobry mojo zana bardzo piękna about the tak. I love my wife, and all I want is a cup of tea, thank you. And that's what I say to Joanne every time. So I haven't learned it. You need a gift to learn languages, and I don't have that gift. So we're married, and then the, the Lord begins to speak. We've got our job, Marks and Spencer, as I told you. We're working, we've got a little home. Um, my granny's house, it was one of them old houses. There was no bathroom in it. I remember very romantic. I went outside with the cows, and I brought in an old tin bath, filled it up with water. But half a thing of bubble bath jumped into it. Next thing I knocked came at the window. All my brothers down arrived to visit, and I'm sitting in the living room in the bath. That's a up. And then Joanna, she was romantic. She was going to go after me, but I'm glad she didn't. That's the sort of uh, wee house we lived in. Very simple conditions. And then I felt the Lord's probing, the Lord's speaking, and uh, we bought a mobile home. We lived in it. I'm now in Marks and Spencer got a promotion into junior management, and the, the five managers came and said, Colin, we need to talk to you because you're no longer focused on your job. And this is Friday afternoon. There's a panel of them, and I'm sitting, and uh, can you explain why you're no longer focused? And I said, can this be postponed till Monday? And on Monday morning, I met them, and I said, listen, I'm a Christian, and I can't work here any longer because I I'm, have to respond to the call of God and he respected that. And we went to Bible college just after that there. Then we went to Kalsimmer in Switzerland to study CEF training with no idea what we were going to do. I thought the only thing you could do is knock doors and give people gospel tracts. You can't do that. It's a wonderful work. But I had no idea what the Lord had in store for us, but step by step. And then after that there, we, we were asked to go to Jamaica and to Australia. And Joanna's going to tell you a little bit about what went on there. Uh, yes, so that was a great uh, learning uh, experience for us um, because suddenly we uh, just packed our bags, uh, left Northern Ireland, and uh, just with the suitcase in our hands, we went to Jamaica for a full year. Now, at that time, uh, at that stage, Colin uh, was after finishing Bible college. He wasn't sure really exactly what uh, God wants him to do in the future, but we were just willing to do whatever we were asked to, to do. So we were there for a full year to look after a mission station, uh, to pastor a church, but there was a lot of other different things to do uh, in that mission station. So every day there was something. There was, um, on Monday nights there was women, women's meeting, on, uh, on another day there was children's meeting, on another day there was uh, youth uh, fellowship. 
Then again, um, we did, on a different day, we went to visit uh, infirmary where there was a lot of people that were maybe elderly or abandoned people, and we maybe went there and Colin preached, and we sometimes brought the guitar and we played the guitar and sang some songs. Um, and you know, as we were living there in that beautiful Jamaica uh, country, um, I just started to see, uh, I was observing Colin, and I could see more and more how he absolutely loved, uh, he was so much looking forward to the children's meetings, youth meetings, anything to do with children. If we did, uh, maybe went to schools in the mornings as well, every morning uh, uh, we went to a different school. And he just, um, he just absolutely loved those moments when he could work with the children um, and be with them. So it was a great learning experience. We came home and then we were asked to go to um, Australia for two years. And again, that was to look after the church, to pastor a church. And while we were there, we started a children's meeting in a, uh, in a local school. And uh, you know, we, we looked after one church, and there was also another little place, uh, a couple of hundred, was it a couple of hundred miles or a hundred miles? Uh, a, a quite a bit of a distance. In Australia, everything is far away, so you, know, you have to travel uh, big distances. But as we were there during those two years, we also um, went into Aboriginal land for a week. Uh, there was no hotels or motels or nowhere where we could have stayed, so we just took two swags. I know swag is nothing, you know, it's not popular here in Northern Ireland, but in Australia it's something very popular to use. It's like a sleeping bag and a mattress all in one. And we just literally stopped on the side of the road. Uh, we bought a bag of wood in a shop and the wood in, in Australia is very hard, so it burns for many hours. And we just lit the fire, we slept there on the side of the road, beside that fire. You know, the fire was scaring the, all the animals, wild animals away. And we just, uh, every day, you know, we, every night we were sleeping there, and we went from school to school, just to share the gospel with Aboriginal children, share the Bibles with them, give them Bibles to, to read, and it was a wonderful experience. And um, we also bought a camper van, and we traveled uh, around, um, uh, the country of Australia for, uh, some, for a few months, and our purpose was to visit 100 schools to share the gospel with the children. So we really, really enjoyed the experience. And again, even being in Australia, I could see that Colin really, really loves uh, the, to work with the children. And as we were coming home to Northern Ireland after uh, that time in Australia, we were wondering, what's next? What uh, plan has God for us? And Colin is going to share that with you. So after pastoring a church for three, four years in Jamaica and Australia, it was really that time that the Lord was putting children's ministry upon our hearts, whether to work with CEF or to work with the local church. Um, to work with CEF, you have to work in an area. To work in a local church, you have to work in a town. Um, but we felt the Lord was having something different than that there. And after some cult and consultation, speaking with some friends, church people, we established, we set up our own ministry called Hope for Youth Ministries. It was just a name to, that I would go under uh, because when you phone up a school, they want to know who do you work for. And if you just say, well, I just work for myself, they'd probably think you're a bit odd. And uh, if you've worked for a denomination, it becomes restrictive. But whenever you have a ministry, uh, when denominations can't go into a school, they let youth ministries in. It's, it's wisdom in a lot of ways. Um, we set up our own ministry, and that's 10 years ago. We celebrated that in May. And to date, we have little cards. Uh, we do missions. We started off going to uh, just doing assemblies, and then we, we do Bible clubs children's missions, and we do an average of 100 to 140, 150 missions every year in schools, just literally reaching, preaching, and teaching the Word of God to children. That's what our ministry is about. It's reaching kids for Christ. And at home, we do that at home. And uh, we also thought uh, we want to give children literature. Literature is expensive. And uh, whenever we do a Bible club, it lasts, for example, an, an hour. So you'll be in a school from 9 o'clock to 10, another one from half 10 to half 11, another one from 12 to 1, then another one from 2 to 3. Sometimes we do 5, and then we do from Easter time right through to the end of the term, we would do another one in the evening. It's very intensive, but the Lord's give us strength. He's give us energy, and we want to utilize that as best as we can, because we're reminded about the grave. One day we're going to arrive there. Unless the Lord comes back, it's absolutely certain, and we want to make every day count for the Lord Jesus. And we also print literature. For example, we've printed 70 
two little tracks. Every time we do a Bible club, every child gets a gospel track. On the back of it is God's plan of salvation, and inside it's about the story that it talks about in the front. We give children books. We've now printed 30 books for children, especially stepping stones, and we've published that in, published that in Polish. It's a stepping stones. is a little book that children get whenever they come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a wee verse in the Bible that talks about the soul winner's joy. And whenever you taste of the soul winner's joy, it's addictive. It's whenever you have the experience of leading a soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got scrapbooks, many scrapbooks at home. When children bring little worksheets back in, can you please tell me how I can become a Christian or show me how I can get saved? And we have the joy of doing that. But the Hope for Youth Ministries is our own name, and we work all over Northern Ireland. This past week, we were in the Bush Mills area for a week. The week before that, we were in Coleraine. Next, this coming week, we're in Cross Gar, and the week after that, we're in Dungannon. We've been four or five schools week after week after week after week. It used to be just summertime, but then the schools, a lot of in September, October, November, December, then January, right through until June. And then this year with the Martin Luther um, 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we started to phone high schools, and we've got into over 30 high schools preaching to the first years right to the upper six. Some schools have to go three times because there's over a thousand young people in the school. And tremendous liberty where the principal comes, he introduces us, and he's given us a length of time, whether it's 8, 10, 12, 15, or 20 minutes. Kilkeel's on the list. I think in the next week or two, we're in Kilkeel High School. So it'll be interesting to see how they behave and how well they listen, and if you need to use my water pistol to keep them awake. And I'm only joking about that. High school listened very well. But then one burden, we often wonder, why did God uh, bring Joanna into my life when there's local girls who cried the day I got married? Um, had to go all the way to Poland and rescue this little girl from being a nun or being on her own. But God has a wonderful picture. And again, the advantage of having an independent ministry is we can be anywhere in the world preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And then we thought, this is how God works. These friends from Coleraine University said, Colin, we're going to go to Poland to do a camp. Will you come with us? And I said to Joanna, do you want to go to Poland for a camp? What week is it? And she said, no, I have an art exhibition. Joanna's an artist. She used to really get into painting. Um, and she said, I can't go. And I said, well, can I go? Poland. I'd love to go back there. And this man, who's, he's not a pastor, but he organizes camps. He said, Colin, lots of teams come out and they play games and they do activities and they help me. But is there anyone your team can teach the Bible to children? And all the team looked at each other. Oh, no, no we don't really do that. We're, we can do games and crafts, but normally it's the pastor does that. I said, well, if you want, I'll do that. He says, Colin, can you come back here again? And I can organize the children. I can organize everything, but I just need somebody to teach the Bible to children. That's like setting, setting a cheesecake in front of me and says, will you please help me? What? Don't ask again. I'll just eat. And I couldn't believe it. This past August, we've just returned from Poland for the 45th time taking teams of young people. Hundreds and hundreds of young people reaching thousands and thousands of Polish children. That's why we've printed stepping stones so we children can get saved. It's a whole new ball game there because you've got the priest, the Catholic Church, who don't like the Christian camps. They hate it when a child comes and says, I've now got saved. They don't like it. So Joanna's going to tell you what that means to her to go back to her country to reach the polls. The polls. <laughs> well, um, we start. We go now to Poland uh, since about ten years, and as Colin said, uh, we already were there for about forty-five times with forty-five different teams. Now, uh, our teams are uh, the smallest team we took, we ever took was eight people, and the biggest team had fifty-five people. So you can imagine 55 people wearing blue hoodies, blue t-shirts. So a third of an airplane was wearing blue color. So it was very interesting. But um, our mission uh, t uh, trips to Poland, they can be from three days long to two weeks long. And we do camps, we do different projects of, for example, taking food to uh, uh, people that are very, very needy. Uh, we do lots of lots of different projects, maybe day camps. Uh, the camps where kids can stay overnight as well. We invite a lot of orphan children from different orphanage, uh, or orphanages. Uh, there's about 200 orphanages in Poland, and most of the children are there uh, because their parents are alcoholics, 
they can't raise them, they don't have enough money, or they, they just don't have interest in their, their own children. So we're able to go there, uh, to take, uh, go there, invite those, those children, and spend time with them, teach them the word of God, uh, share Bible stories, and they absolutely love Bible stories because they don't really know those stories. That reminds me, when I was growing up in Poland, you know, you never read the Bible. You didn't know anything about Old Testament. You didn't know who Moses was, Abraham, Esther, Samuel, Elijah, all those characters. So whenever we go to camps in Poland, Colin is able to tell the stories, or we use different volunteers, you know, to tell those stories. And children just really listen and absorb, and they've never heard those stories before. And very often, those uh, some kids are from, uh, you know, Catholic families, and um, quite often, you know, they ask lots of different questions, and then we have discussions, we have life lessons, different workshops. Um, so, um, you know, when, when we do those uh, trips, uh, they work on many different levels. First of all, we do something for the children there. We share the gospel with people. But also, the young people or any people that we take on our teams, they really are blessed. You know, they go there to those uh, mission trips so they could give the blessing to, to others or, or be blessing to others. But they actually come home doubly blessed. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful. And of course, you can imagine that the fact that the gospel is, sh is shared so much in my own country, it just brings such a joy to my heart. And of course, I love being in Poland because I can eat Polish food, talk Pol uh, I can talk Polish language, and spend time with Polish people, and it's just wonderful. So, back to Colin again. I remember when Joanna first came, she had her Polish Bible, and there's this older gentleman in church, and the pastor announced the text that he's going to preach from. And Joanna's going to find him. He's impatient with this young girl, unable to find the portion. Of course, this was all new to Joanna, way in the book of Haggai or somewhere in the Old Testament. So he takes it from her, and he's flicking through it, and he turns it upside down, the back of the front, and he just goes, rrr, rrr, rrr. he just gives it back to her. <laughs> he couldn't understand it was a different language. He thought he was eyesight was going, and he had to learn to be patient. Another avenue of ministry I forgot to mention was Tullymore Camps. Last year we had camps in Tullymore for the 12th consecutive year, and that's grown up from having a kitchen and a, and a cattle trailer to a wee tent to several tents, and now we've got 16 army tents, a big, the big white three, five pole uh, marquee, and with 431 children and camper and volunteers at Tullymore this past year. And the Lord has blessed that, I think, every year with salvation of children and young people. In the first week this year, there was, there were three camps every year, two children children's camp and a youth camp. And the first year there was 15 children, and the second year there was 14 children come to the Lord. It was that much excitement every morning and devotion where we were praying with expectancy, Lord, who is it today? And who is it today? While we're having a breakfast, a wee boy comes up and says to me, Colin, will you help me become a Christian? I goes, when? He goes, now. I says, can you not wait to the meeting? No. What about after breakfast? He goes, I want to get saved before breakfast. And imagine sitting down your breakfast. And that's a big thing for me to set my breakfast down and set it down and go. And then there's this other man from Ballymena. He's a deacon in the, in the Baptist church there. And I said, have you ever led a child to the Lord? He says, no. I says, would well, you know what to do if a child came? He goes, I would. Well, I said, this wee boy wants to get saved. And half an hour later, the eyes are tripping the big man, leading a child to the Lord. It's beautiful, the soul winner's joy. And um, we've just summed up our story. I'm just going to finish now. But... Um, we have a newsletter at the back. It's our latest newsletter. And inside there's a, a double page of our missions. We we'll covered your prayer uh, for them as we go week after week, reaching the children of this country of the gospel. Um, and also, um, Joanna wrote a book many years ago called The Tangle Lamb. And I've just uh, published my own book. I asked a couple of authors if they'd write my story. And they looked at me and they laughed at me and they said, no. And I said, that's okay. I'll write it myself. And I did. And it's called No Ordinary Journey. Because it is no ordinary journey, it's an extraordinary journey with God. And that's just, we just printed that about a fortnight ago. There outside on the table, if you'd like to take one, just take it, and you can put your name on it and follow that up with payment some other time. But uh, I would encourage you to read that. The Lord's been good. How he's took a little boy from the countryside to marry a girl from Poland, and they're bringing us into his work to serve him to reach thousands of children with the gospel. But to finish off uh, what we've been reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and verse 10, it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whether thou goest. And I've made a good decision in life. 
We don't all make good decisions. Some decisions we make and we doubt them. We question them. People doubt them. People question them. But I know with my salvation, I never, ever once doubted it. Never regretted it. The only regret I might have had, I didn't do it when I was seven. I say that to children, almost in every school, children will say, when did you become a Christian? And I said, I was 17, but I wish it was seven. But you can't turn back the clock. Nobody in this congregation tonight can turn back the clock and say, I wish it was 10. I wish it was 15. You're at the stage in life now, and you can't turn it back, and you can't fast forward it, but it's going to go forward. And if you're not a Christian tonight and you've listened to how God has had mercy on my soul and on Joanna's soul, a wee girl in Poland who could have been passed by the 40 million people, God had mercy on her soul. If you sit here and I've listened to your pastor preach, he's all over YouTube. You don't go on to Facebook and George pops up. And what's he doing? He's pleading with souls to come to Christ. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. I can be certain one thing I can guarantee you, it's not your next birthday. It's not your next car. It's not your next phone. It's the grave. And the grave's not a nice place, but it's a guarantee. But the Lord Jesus says, he that hath the Son hath life. But if you have not the Son of God, you don't have life. One of the verses we were teaching the children this week was, as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. For a child to get saved and to understand the importance of salvation, they need to understand there's consequences of death. And that's what we talked about the tree. Disobedience. The Lord says you can eat whatever you want, but don't touch the one tree. Imagine George in his announcement said, folks, if you don't mind, in the way out, don't be touching the door. They've just been varnished. So you're walking past the door and it says, wet varnish, do not touch. Who would walk past the door and go? Why do you do that? Well, there's a big pavlova in the, in the kitchen at home, and whoever made it says, this is fresh cream. It's special cream. Don't put your finger on it. I'm talking to the men here. And the wife, she nips up the stairs. Who would go, don't touch the fresh cream. It's special. When you do that, I know I will have the spoon out. <laughs> You do that. The Lord says, don't touch. And you do. The Lord Jesus says, come unto me. He's calling you. He's wanting you. He's whispering you. He's using the still small voice. He's not using the earthquakes. He's not using the loud music and all those other things. He's just whispering. Come unto me, all you that labor. The Lord Jesus says, come unto me, little children. Come unto me, older people. And you can't hear him. I wonder, can you hear him? That's the Spirit of God you can hear in your heart. My voice is going to be silent very shortly. You're going to go home, and you're going to hear the Lord's heart, voice ringing in your heart. Tonight, now, it's accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. See, tomorrow morning, that voice could stop. You might never hear it again. You might never hear it again. See, the grave's real. Every day you can be certain you open the paper, you'll see names. Names of people. One day that's going to be your name. One day the church is going to be full of your friends. And the only question that's really important is that person absent in the body or present with the Lord. Maybe you're going to sit with a gulp in your throat saying they're not saved and I should have been the one to tell them. It's too late then. That's what the Catholic Church does.